My pleasure to introduce Dr. Maria Barakal. Uh, for those of you who have not met Maria, Maria is one of the most sought after speakers in our profession. She's given over, I think, 600 lectures around the world. She was kind enough to come to Wills recently. She's won multiple awards, including the Founders Awards from ASRS. And she's one of the most talented surgeons I've ever seen. And she'll be sharing some of her insights into minimal membranectomies on the management of diabetic TRDs. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much, Sunir. It is a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, this technique that I that I came up with. Are you seeing my screen? Okay. Okay, so traction retinal detachments really uh, affect many of the diabetic patients. 40% of all vitrectomies in diabetic eyes are for TRDs. And traction and regimentogenous detachments account for 20% of all vitrectomies. Um, we know that traction and retinal, uh, tractional retinal detachments are more common and uh, severe in younger diabetics. And it's because a vitreous detachment is protective. It is protective not only for progression of retinopathy, but it is really the mechanism by which traction retinal detachments occur. So most of the people that are affected by this tend to be younger, unfortunately. Um, we all know that the goals of vitrectomy for attraction retinal detachment is to remove medial opacities and remove anteroposterior and tangential traction. But despite all the advancements that we've had in vitrectomy, we still know that a large proportion of eyes experience visual loss with vitrectomy and anatomic failure. And iatrogenic breaks occur in between 29 and 37 uh, percent of all eyes that undergo vitrectomy for traction retinal detachment. And that gives you very poor prognosis. Uh, in monocular patients, it's even more challenging. I'm often, you know, I see a monocular patient, this is only eye has a traction retinal detachment. I know it's going to get worse. You know, the patient uh, had a bad response in the other eye. And those eyes do badly. Uh, we know that 52% of eyes. Uh, that had had a, that have a blind fellow eye will have decreased vision with vitrectomy, and 13% with and will end up NLP. And when we looked at uh, the fellow eye study, uh, once an eye requires surgery, 38% will require surgery in the other eye within 1.6 years. And Latinos, you know, I uh, we know that Hispanics have actually have a higher incidence and more severe uh, diabetic retinopathy, higher incidence of diabetes. Uh, I practice in Puerto Rico and uh, they have three times more visual impairment in the US than non-Hispanics. And uh, vitrectomy for TRD from the Lala studies, 40% had worse visual acuity post-op than pre-op. And the mean post-op vitrectomy visual acuity was hand motions. Uh, so, you know, we know that these eyes uh, do poorly. So how, how did we, did I come up with this? Well, this is a patient uh, of mine. I had done the other eye. The other eye had a very similar uh, traction detachment with very massive uh, fibrous tissue. He was a 60 year old heavy smoker. I operated the eye twice. It ended up NLP. And the second eye looked very similar, it's this eye here. And I had been following him for 11 years and the vision kept getting worse from 2070 to 2400 because of this fibrous tissue that kept forming. I, from the OCT, I knew uh, that the phobia was attached uh, in the center, even though it looked you know, fairly ischemic, but I kept avoiding, he wanted surgery. And I said, well, let's see you in three months. You know, because I really didn't want to go into this eye because I knew you know, what had happened to the other eye. So I thought about what I could do. So I said, maybe I, this is the eye, maybe I can just clear the center because I knew the vision had gotten much worse because of this fibrous tissue. I couldn't really open this except with diathermy. I tried with everything, it was very taut. So I, I made an opening with diathermy and then I opened all around. Uh, and I said, I'm just gonna open the center and do some relaxing incisions uh, in that thick membrane that had centripetal traction uh, and then clear all of the attachments from the vitreous to the periphery. And this is the eye. 
And he maintained 2070 vision just by doing this for five years until he died. So after I did this, you know, I when I did the surgery, I was very careful not to create any traction, not to create any breaks. And I have been doing this on a number of patients uh, that have similar situations. And I published this um, uh, and I thought about, you know, how to reduce the risk. I did it initially on one eye patients, but now I do it on very severe eyes that, that look sort of similar. And uh, I included nine eyes, seven were male, two female. The average age was 58. Uh, duration of retinopathy of, of diabetes, 24 years. And I followed them for a mean of 4.5 years. And uh, basically the surgical technique is I first, I did uh, them in 27 and 25. Uh, four of the eyes had combined phaco IOL because uh, there was significant lens opacities. And, and basically I used high-speed cutters. I removed all of the attachments of the vitreous to these membranes wherever they were. And then I opened the very thick hyaloid. And not only did I free the center, but I did these radial incisions, which are really, really important because you don't want that centripetal attraction to continue progressing. And I did not leave tamponade. I added laser in areas of attached retina uh, where it was necessary. And I'll show you more cases. You know, the OCT is really important because this eye may not look that bad, but obviously it had, uh, the macula was detached. The visual acuity was 2100 and the post-op picture is on the right, it's 2030. Uh, this is another eye, uh, which 45 year old at 2200, I could see by the OCT that the macula was detached, macula was attached afterwards and the center was free. And here you can you can see the surgery, and they all have in common, you know, this very you know thick fibrous tissue just going through through everything, basically a very thickened hyaloid. So this one I was able to open it just with the cutter uh, instead of having to use the diathermy like in the first one, and then I'm just opening it all around, and and you can see as we do this how how much traction is there, particularly when we do the relaxing incisions here, because you see how the tissue all falls back, uh, pulls back towards each other. I just do relaxing wherever I feel it's completely safe to do that. So, because I really don't want to create an iatrogenic break. This was, you know, the best eye of this patient who was a musician and, and he has maintained really good vision uh, for a long time. Uh, this is another eye, uh, monocular visual acuity 2400. From the OCT, I could see there were traction areas. I'm doing it 27. And, and again, the same thing. I'm just removing all the, uh, the hyaloid in the periphery, all of the attachments throughout. Then uh, oftentimes, sometimes I start you know, from the inside out. This was a more complex patient because it was not only the very taut, thick hyaloid. It also had some membranes. So I'm just clearing all that, doing the relaxing uh, incisions. Uh, I do not have intraoperative OCT, which would have been nice in, in this case, but I'm just going around uh, freeing, you know, wherever I see that there is no, um, no means of me doing breaks. So I'm just doing those relaxings around and there's still membranes there. So I'm doing this with the 27 gauge protractor, which I think is very useful for this because it really controls uh, you know, aspiration in. I'm using forceps here just to clear that membrane that was still there. I'm just changing some of the light filters to try and see it better. Uh, and I'm doing this, you know, very carefully because I certainly didn't want to create a break. You can see the subretinal membranes there because this was very long standing um, area. You know, the, the posterior pole had been uh, tractionally detached for some time. So I'm just clearing all that, getting under the membrane, doing like blunt dissection from side to side, uh, trying not to cause uh, any traction there because that, uh, you know, as you can see, it was uh, tractionally detached. You can see the retina moving. I make sure there's no attachments left towards the periphery. And in this case, I did leave air. Uh, and I applied more laser to the periphery because I wanted it to try and, and position him for one or two days to try and flatten the fovea. See how nicely the fovea flattened and it maintained 2070 uh, for a long time. So our results were pretty good. 
you know, all of the patients uh, improved vision, uh, at least two lines, and had an attached macula. Uh, complications were vitreous hemorrhage. And I always do in office fluid air exchanges. I think it's a really useful technique. I have a video on it in I2. And it really keeps the patient from having to go to the OR again. And uh, as two patients had posterior capsular opacities treated with YAG. So I think that doing this technique in really high risk eyes is something that will keep you from losing eyes that in the past I used to lose by trying to be too aggressive and remove all of the memories. We really don't need to do that. We have to think about what we want to accomplish in each case. I think the OCT is priceless for that, to really know the status of the phobia. And, and you know, most of the patient's vision really is the phobia. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so in summary, this minimal membranectomy to relieve traction should be considered in high-risk eyes. And the key to it is it remove all of the vitreous attachments to the membranes and do radial uh, incisions in the membrane to relieve circumferential traction. So thank you so much for having me uh, here. It is an honor.